Hi, and welcome to the next lecture in fluid mechanics. Last time, we finished our exploration of the conservation equations by exploring the common assumptions in fluid mechanics. Without assumptions, the equations are incredibly difficult to solve directly. Luckily, there are plenty of common assumptions that apply to real-life flow situations. Today, we pivot and start to consider dimensionality. Fluids analysis is rooted in finding non-dimensional numbers and exploring quantities relative to others. We consider the power of dimensions, specifically the rule of dimensional homogeneity, and how it allows us to solve problems in engineering with little to no physics knowledge. Our focus in this video is dimensional homogeneity, and it starts our exploration of thinking about units and dimensions. But before we explore this rule of dimensional homogeneity, let's get familiar with the common dimensions in fluid mechanics. Most properties in fluids are made up of three base dimensions, mass, length, and time. When expressing the dimensions of a quantity, I tend to put it in brackets for clarity. Mass has the symbol m, length has the symbol l, and time has the symbol t. Note here I use dimensions to refer to the abstract mass, length, and time, whereas units are more specific, like kilogram, meter, and seconds. There are a number of widely used parameters in fluid mechanics. Let's summarize them, their common symbols, and their base dimensions. This list of common parameters includes area, volume, mass, density, pressure, force, and dynamic viscosity. And finally, while I never use it in my videos, the kinematic viscosity is also quite common in fluid mechanics, which is really just the dynamic viscosity normalized by density. I prefer not to complicate things and stick with just dynamic viscosity. This is an important chart to remember, and working with fluids for any period of time, you will inherently memorize the dimensions that each parameter has. Knowing the dimensions of the quantity you're looking for can be very helpful in trying to figure out answers and analysis. You can use dimensional homogeneity to do simple yet effective analysis with just the dimensions of the problem. The rule states that in an equation, all terms must have the same units. This isn't just a rule in fluid mechanics. It's a basic rule of science and arithmetic. To show how obvious it is, consider what your answer would be if you were asked to add 10 hours to 1 kilometer. You can't really answer it because it doesn't make any sense. When you add two quantities together to get a third quantity, all those quantities have the same dimension, whether it's hours, kilometers, or kilograms. Let's consider generalizing dimensional homogeneity. To ensure that the three base dimensions are consistent throughout an equation, the exponents of each base dimension must be equal on both sides of the equation. If m, l, and t have the exponents of a, b, and c on the left side, and d, e, and f on the right, then a equals d, b equals e, and c equals f. This ensures that there are the same dimensions on the left-hand side and right-hand side of the equation. We can try and apply this generalized rule to a few real-life examples to see how powerful it really is. I have two daughters. In the summer when it's hot, sometimes they like to play with the hose. Now, my oldest daughter can be a bit mischievous and likes to obliterate my youngest daughter with the hose. One day, I got to thinking, is there any way I can take the things that I know, like the hose geometry, things that I can measure, like the hose velocity, and guess the force my youngest daughter feels when being blasted with the hose. And to make things interesting, I'm not allowed to use any physics knowledge. No flow rate stuff or F equals MA. The first thing you do with any problem is you gather what you think will be meaningful parameters. First, we have the hose diameter, some average flow velocity, and what we're after is the force exerted on my daughter by the hose. Now, we compare the base dimensions of what we want to solve for, the force, to the other parameters in the problem, like diameter and velocity. And in writing these down, you might notice that we've immediately hit a snag. 
force has mass in it at its base dimension, but our two parameters so far only have length and time. This means, no matter what we do, we can't make diameter and velocity give us a force. We need something with mass in it. At this point, you can start to consider basic fluid properties. When you're searching for mass, the fluid density is usually the parameter you need. Let's include fluid density in our analysis. And it makes sense because the denser a fluid is, the higher the force it can exert. Our goal here is to find a functional relationship between the force and some or multiple combination of these parameters. And the most basic way to do this without already knowing the answer is to guess and check all the different combinations. Let's start simple and then add complexity in our guesses. First, we start with the simplest combination of parameters that give us mass, length, and time. This combination is some product of just velocity and density. So, we set it up with generalized exponents. Here, f equals u to the a and rho to the b, where we are solving for a and b. With this type of analysis, there is always an unknown unit-free constant out front. This is the best we'll be able to do with dimensional analysis. We won't be able to solve for the constant, but we will know how force behaves with respect to these flow parameters. Now, we replace our equation with the base dimension version. On the left-hand side, we have the base dimensions of force, and on the right-hand side, we have the base dimensions of velocity to exponent a, and the base dimensions of density to exponent b. Next, we distribute our exponents and combine all our base dimensions. Now we need to solve for a and b. Each base unit is independent. The masses don't interact with the lengths or the times, and vice versa. So we can get a system of three equations of exponents, because we know that on the left-hand side, exponents must equal to the right-hand side. In this case, we have two variables, a and b, and three equations, so it's a bit overdefined. However, we need to check if it works. With the mass exponents, we find b equals 1, and the time exponents shows us that a equals 2. However, if we plug these values for a and b into the length exponents, it doesn't work. This means that there are no combinations of velocity and density that gives us the units of force. While they have the necessary base dimensions, mass, length, and time, there's no set of exponents that make it work. So we need to try again with another combination. The only other combination of parameters that have the combined base dimensions of force are diameter, velocity, and density. We do the generalization first, putting a constant out front and exponents a, b, and c. Then we write an equation for the base dimensions. Distribute the exponents, and gather all like dimensions, mass, length, and time. Set up the system of equations for the exponents. Here, the mass tells us that c equals 1, the time tells us that b equals 2. And finally, the length lets us solve for a, which equals 2. Good, the equations are satisfied. This means there is a combination of these three parameters, that make the units of force. Our analysis, completely lacking any physics knowledge, says that the force goes as diameter squared, velocity squared, and linearly with density. Out front, we have an unknown unitless constant. Let's compare this to reality, which is based in physics. The force is equal to the average velocity times the mass flow rate, which turns into rho ua. And the area of a circle, which is the exit of the hose, is pi over 4 times d squared. So, comparing back to our guess, it looks like we were right. Force goes as rho u squared, d squared, and the constant turned out to be pi over 4. And all this was determined with only knowing the units of the problem. Let's try a second example. Say you're given a wind tunnel, but we don't know anything about the velocity in the test section when you turn it on. You want to be able to know how much turning the velocity knob changes the velocity, but we lost the instructions. Wind tunnels have a contraction, typically, 
where it goes from the large area with slow moving flow to a small area with fast moving flow. In the test section, we put the models and introduce the models to fast moving flow. For a measurement, we figured out how to make a manometer, which helps us get the pressure difference between the two locations. Our two locations are a point in the large area of the contraction and a point before the test section. Let's see if, without physics, we can determine how the velocity changes with the pressure difference. Gather our important parameters and write out the base dimensions. Notice that this pressure has mass in it, so we need more than just velocity. Like last time, we look to fluid density for a mass that we need. In this case, there is only one combination of parameters to try. Our goal is to get delta P as a function of u and rho. We assume the general form with a constant out front and exponents a and b. Write the equation for the dimensions, distribute the exponents, and gather the like dimensions. We have two exponents and three possible equations for each dimension. Mass tells us that b equals 1. Time tells us a equals 2. And the length equation works when we plug these values in. So it all checks out. There is a combination of u and rho that makes the units of pressure. Our guess, with the exponent values in place, is that delta p goes as u squared rho with an unknown constant. If we compare that to the real answer, we find that it goes delta p goes as one half rho u squared. So we were right again. As you can see, if you're able to gather the proper parameters of a problem, with just the knowledge of the units, you can get close to the answer. In practice, checking your units as you go can save you a lot of frustration. It's terrible to get through a long derivation and come to an answer with the wrong units because you know you screwed up somewhere. So, make good habits of checking units along the way and you'll find success. When judging other people's work, one of the fastest error checks you can do is to look for inconsistent units. And that's it. That's the power of units and dimensions. Let's review. We started by introducing the concept of dimensional homogeneity, that all equations must have consistent units and you can't combine two things with different units. The three main base dimensions for fluids are mass, length, and time, and they're distributed in many different parameters in different ways. Then, we learned how to use the dimensional homogeneity to crudely solve problems without knowledge of physics through two examples. In each case, we tried combinations of the problem parameters and got very close to the right answer, at least within a constant. In practice, checking units is essential in catching our own and other mistakes. I hope you liked the video, and thanks for watching.